All right. Well, it is 5.03 p.m. on Monday, November 9th. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. Uh, all commissioners are present, as are um, Fred uh, Satink. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Satink, I've heard much worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, from VLCT. And um, is, I don't know your first name, Ab Abar? Another representative from VLTC. Can you say Vicky Abear? Vicky Abear. Yes. From 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 VLTC. Yeah. Um, and Jessica Patterson is here, and Mike Sullivan. Um, who is who is Hardwick Electric, Mike? That's the host character on the chart. It, that's me. Okay. The top two, the the top left and the top middle are both me. on my screen anyway. Yeah, I think placement is different. Uh, okay, uh, so we have a quorum. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? I'll just note that um, I told Sean Enterline that we'd probably expect him around six or so, six okay. to 630, so. Okay. Um, and which takes us to uh, the minutes. Uh, does anybody have any comments on the minutes from the 12th? This was the meeting with the select board. I just have one um, correction. Um, and that, sorry, I've got to get back to the minutes. Um, I think I suggested that select board members might want to attend monthly meetings to better understand what we do. Um, I don't think I made a request that this in that in the, that sense that they come. So I would I would ask that the word requested be changed to suggested. Okay. Yeah, I was confused. I think I did this originally wrong, and you corrected me, and I didn't understand your correction correctly. Sorry about that. So, um, so, so with that change, um, is there a motion to approve the October 12th minutes? So moved. Second. So second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, the minutes are approved with that change, Mike. So if you would. Yep. I've got it. And are there any uh, comments or changes for the minutes for the October 19th meeting? Um, is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, minutes are approved. Okay, um, since we don't have anyone from the public here, um, we don't have any public comment, uh, which takes us to um, Fred. I will and I'll just share that uh, the recording process, getting that to Leaf went flawlessly, no problem, and he and I are all good. Great. Great. That's terrific. Are we then, Mike, continuing to do that? Correct. I'm going to provide him uh, with the recording monthly. Okay. So. Um, so, um, yeah. So, Frank and Vicki, uh, Fred, sorry, and Vicki, welcome. Uh, I don't usually butcher people's names quite that badly. Um, thanks for for coming. Um, I think that you know we would we'd like to better understand um, what insurance coverage we have, uh, what the amount of the insurance is, what's expressed, what is excluded from that coverage. 
Um, and I think that would probably be a good place to start. And then if there may be some follow on questions. Okay, um, <clears throat> well, I guess a couple of things. I did, I did get um, a list of questions from Mike and um, I, I don't know if you want me to kind of touch on, on some of those responses because I did kind of formulate some responses to those. I guess I can um, broadly kind of give you an overview of the coverages. So, and, and you know, correct me or redirect me anywhere along the way. <clears throat> if your, your focus is uh, more of interested on public officials liability coverage, um, which you know I've seen within some of the emails that that's been the case, um, then we can spend a little more time on that. But, but in general, you know, passive coverage is broken up into groups. There's property coverage, there's workers' compensation coverage for employees, there's general liability coverage, which uh, your general liability coverage is excellent. You have $10 million in limits. Um, for property coverage, you give us scheduled values uh, for structures. And um, we use those to provide you with, uh, typically we can select some different coverages, but I would venture to say that probably most, if not all of your, your buildings are guaranteed replacement costs. Uh, you probably have some, what we call property in the open, things such as uh, fencing and the like. Um, those are rated a little differently, but, but there's coverage for those. Um, you have auto coverage for your vehicle. So if they're damaged in a collision, there's a coverage for the damaged vehicle. If uh, it's, you know, you're at fault, your driver's at fault, and um, there's a, an auto liability claim, we provide auto liability coverage uh, for that um, instance. And there's very good coverage then for that as well. That's the same $10 million limit. Um, thousand dollar deductible. Uh, yeah, yeah, thousand dollar deductible. Um, and then, then there's a, a couple of other coverages. You have your crime coverage, which, as you're, I'm probably all aware, came in handy several years back. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we provide five hundred thousand dollar limit. You know, for kind of like in that that particular instance, that was a faithful performance or whatever it was type of claim. So there's good coverage there. And then there's different types. Of can, I, can I step in, Fred? Yeah, Fred? yeah, sure. Feel free. What was that last one you just spoke to, please? Could you say that again? What, the the faithful performance? Or the, the 500? Crime? Yeah, whatever that last bullet was you just spoke to. Yeah, so you have crime coverage. I mean, there, there's several different kind of sublimits, and I don't know, maybe Vicky's, maybe she can kind of look as we're talking here a little bit, but there's kind of some different sublimits for, and, and kind of I'll call them sub coverages under crime coverage. But your big limit is came in handy when we had the, the fraud case where somebody embezzled money. Um, and you know that particular claim. So you okay? So that's uh, that's what I thought I heard you yeah. say, and that's why yeah. I'm stepping in because <clears throat> VLCT won't supply us with that coverage anymore. We don't uh, have it. Well, no, she doesn't have it. You're that that individual. We terminated coverage on that particular individual, but I don't believe that that as a whole hardwick electric doesn't have that coverage i believe that you do so 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 if we had a new embezzlement god forbid um by somebody else that we would still have coverage i believe so and vicky i don't know while we're looking you can double check but so the way that it typically works is um and thank you for your questions i mean i think this is we want to try to have a dialogue and answer your question so yeah, I'll have to go back in a little bit of time, but I, not that long ago, um, somebody in a discussion, and I was talking to somebody at VLCT, and they told us that we are not uh, provided with that coverage because of the embezzlement, because we... Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, Mike, that doesn't sound right to me, because no. essentially what we do is when, when the allegation is made... Um, you know, basically, I end up sending a letter out to the member 
saying that that person no longer has coverage. So we're not going to cover anything okay. subsequent. But it's not like to the member, like you lose your ability to have that coverage. That's so, great. Well, not, if you can yeah, confirm so, that, that'll be great. Yeah, we can probably do it right here in the call, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that you've, as, as an entity, as Hardwick Electric, as our member, you still have that coverage. It's just that that employee at that time lost coverage. And right. that's, that's kind of, I think, how it works. But Vicki's reading, and so maybe she'll, <laughs> she'll, she'll be able to clarify I'll, that. I'll find you. it after the meeting's over. <laughs> no, that's okay. We, we can follow up, Mike. We can certainly follow yeah. up with an email to you to provide any uh, additional responses that might be necessary as, you know, as a result of our discussion. So um, the, the computer fraud coverage, as I read the declarations page, is $25,000. Uh, under what coverage? Under the crime and fidelity coverage. Okay, yeah. Is it, is it covered someplace else as well under a different coverage? Because that strikes me if, if, if we got hacked, well, then our, our bank account got hacked, yeah. it, it, I could see how $25,000 might not cover it. Well, so there's there's different nuances in that. If it's if there's if there's a, a hacking event, um, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> um, we had well, I mean it's public record. So um, the town of Norwich, you, you may be aware, had a, a person, a finance person that um, was, I guess, fraudulently misled via emails to send money to you know a bogus account multiple transaction wire transfers and so that's wire transfer fraud and um so we we provide some coverage for that again it's not depending on the loss it 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 may not fully <coughs> reimburse you for the loss um and then i think new for 2021 under cyber coverage there's going to be some, also some coverage available uh, for wire transfer fraud, but only if the person that's engaged in the fraudulent or I guess make, ex executes the fraudulent transaction, your employee, only if they verified with the sender that it was a legitimate transaction. So in other words, if you do that, the likelihood of having a claim is pretty low, but that's one of the caveats of the coverage that's in there. So, I mean, I think that the challenge is for us, is there's a lot of different scenarios that can occur and depending on what it is, that's what coverage it falls onto, uh, you know, under. So it's kind of the related to the nuance of the situation um, as far as those crime coverages go. And let me see, Vicki, do you have a, a crime deck page handy or I can pull up, uh, I think I've got a PC. I do have the crime deck page. Section four. Yeah, so I, I've got one here. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, so that's pretty much it. Um, money orders, counterfeit money, 25,000, computer fraud, 25,000, fund transfer fraud, 25,000. Um, and, and so those are the limits provided. And it's possible, I mean, that's where that's. For those reasons, because that's not, I would say, you know, it's not high limit coverage. It's really critical that members have, you know, really good financial controls and, you know, double signatures and verifying senders and all those kinds of things, because, you know, you're potentially putting funds at risk. And in fact, the town of Norwich, I mean, our coverage, we modified our coverage language so that if that same thing occurred today, they wouldn't be entitled to as much money as, as they were at the time that the claim occurred because it occurred under a different policy period with different language. You know, these can be, I don't wanna say due to member, um, kind of a little bit attention to detail that these can be costly claims for, for passive. 
And, and, you know, remember that, you know, we're member owned, you know, you along with all of our other members own our assets. And so as those assets get depleted by claims or uh, claims hit reinsurance, then that costs us a lot more to provide you with insurance coverage. So that's why it's just critical, you know, risk management practices, risk management practices, risk management practices, kind of the motto. Um, and, and certainly insurance is there if you need it. And, and I think it's, it's come into play very nicely for you. Um, you know, with regard to the, the fraud claim there several years back. Um, but, you know, obviously we, we don't want those and you don't want them either because then you, either somebody's out money or there's protracted legal, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. These things take years to finally settle and, you know, there's, there's no good winner and it does affect everybody's rates. The more losses we have, you know, the, the more impact on rates that it has. Um, so anyway, so yes, that's that's your your fraud and your your crime uh, crime coverage. Then there's uh, public official liability coverage, which you have some very good coverage for. Um, and I think you know to relate it to some of your questions, um, maybe I can try to touch on some of those and then just you know stop me if, if I get off track or I'm not answering your question. I'd, I'd but, like to talk about the casualty coverage for a moment, since because sure. uh, I think I think we will spend more time on okay on 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 the section five coverages, but mm -hmm. um, didn't have the declarations page, um, and our coverage. If we have a dam failure, yeah. Um, if if there was a failure, let's say at the Wolcott Dam, and there was a whole lot of water that came down the river and and caused damage downstream downstream liability yeah. yeah let me see what you have listed for it, dams it looks like it's one million dollars which doesn't well, seem very well, much yes i mean that's the limit that mm -hmm. we provide um and that is dependent on and i kind of do remember looking at those dams vicky yeah. but i can't remember whether we, we whether we provide downstream liability coverage to you or not is whether we accept the dam and, and kind of the exposure, if you will. So that's kind of on a case by case basis. So Vicky's gonna look up and see. Yeah, whether, okay. whether, whether, So that's whether, downstream liability. That's just on um, uh, damage to the dam itself. No, it's not not damage to the structure, but it's it's downstream liability only. Where's so, dam that the damage to the structure would be in the property insurance? No, we don't cover dams. You don't cover dams. Yeah, there's no coverage for for the dams the, 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 as a as a as a building or structure. Those are um, it's a third party coverage. The liability for the, the downstream liability for the dams. Um, right. It's so we have two that have that coverage. Um, one is the Caspian Lake Dam, and the other is the Woolcut Dam. Um, the others are not covered for downstream liability. But Caspian Lake and Wilkett are. Correct. Yeah, the up other to, one, up the, to a million dollars. The East Long Pond, I'm trying to remember, is that one of them? The what? Oh, East Long Pond, yep. Yeah. yeah, that is not covered, but it, okay. yeah, it's, it's on the schedule, but it, it says it's not covered. Um, yeah, Nichols Max, Pond. Maxville, is Maxville covered? Maxville is not covered. I'm not sure why. Um, I'm, I, I just I just show that we have only the Wolka and the Caspian Lake dams um, that are covered for downstream liability. Yeah, I do remember looking at, at all those, Vicki, actually. I'm okay. no, <clears throat> the Macville and the East Long and the Wolka. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. When was the last time that coverage was revised? Well, I mean, coverage is, we, we just sent out a renewal and uh, I, I'm not sure, Mike, you probably have completed or Jessica, you've probably already resubmitted your renewal for 2021. I just did it the other day. It's probably on Jessica's desk. No, I emailed it to Vicki. Yeah, okay. we got it. Let's, let's, can, when, when do you have to have it? Because we may want to, you know, at least explore some, 
I don't know how other people feel and we haven't had a chance. We're just learning what the coverages are now. Um, yep. But um, Lynn, anyhow. You know, I'll just share three thoughts on the three that aren't covered, Lynn. Mm -hmm. So if East Long had a problem, that dumps into Nichols Pond, which has essentially a brand new dam on it. It already failed and Hardwick Electric uh, managed the rebuilding of that um, with funds from property owners around the pond. So that was in excellent condition. Uh, Macville was rebuilt, I think, around 2008, Jess, does that sound right? Uh, no, I think it was before I started, 2001. Okay, so that relatively not long ago in the world of a dam. So that was in very good condition as well. Um, I would say Woolcott obviously has insurance because it's a high risk dam. And I believe they consider uh, Caspian a high risk as well because it contains so many acre feet of water behind it. So the ones that aren't covered, I think there's probably some, maybe some logic that people used in the past, but I'm just sharing that for info. I, I guess I was asking not just about which dams were covered and, and whether we should have additional dams covered, but whether a million dollars coverage is sufficient. And, and part of the answer to that is also, what does it cost us and what does it cost us to have more? Um, and, and maybe you've looked into that, Mike, and if you have, you know, but I, that strikes me as, as, um, as, as a question. Yeah, I mean, that, that would seem to be a fair question. And I think the only other thing I'll add is, is that should you choose to, um, you know, discuss among yourselves and decide that you want to pursue adding any of the other dams, we can certainly revisit that. And it, so you can do that at any time. And then we'll kind of go through our review, our review process and then decide whether we want to accept it or not. So, so would, would this be a secondary underwriter? Uh, would this uh, be a third party reinsurer? How would that work? Would this be part of VLCT? Well, if you're going to add, if you add um, additional <laughs> dams, I mean, that's with, that's with us. Okay, and adding, increasing the coverage. Yeah, so if you decide to add limits, then that would be, you know, an external policy. Um, we could certainly, um, you know, try to assist you or try to seek some placements for that. Um, you know, I don't know whether the New England Power Pool Association or whatever that kind of insurance group is, I'm sure you're probably aware of it, um, whether they offer what kind of limits or, or dollar values they might uh, offer. Um, and I do have a, a market actually that's kind of a, a rural utility um, captive that likes to write kind of unique exposures. And so that's kind of an alternative market that we could approach if that was something that you were interested in looking at further. Uh, do you have we, we wouldn't be taking the risk. We would look for another policy to. Would you have to. any idea what the multiplier is? I have, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to venture a guess in this era. All I would say is that in this era of um, elevated property rates and elevated property reinsurance and sensitivity to flood exposure, um, it's probably going to be as pricey as it is ever been. Yeah. It, you know, if our reinsurance costs on the property side have, you know, gone up drastically uh, in the last two years. And uh, just, you know, with all the, I mean, we all read it in the news between the wildfires, the floods, the 50 inches of rain, you know. And, and it, so, yeah. just thinking out loud, that almost <clears throat> feels like it should be added to the cost basis of the, the power generated at Wolcott, for example. I mean, the, the downstream exposure for dam failure, I mean, a million dollars doesn't go very far. No, it's true. You know, you, you, you lose a few houses and, and that's it, you know, that's right. about all you got. Why, why are there so many dams under the HET purview? They're not hydro there plants. Aren't, there aren't so many. I mean, considering the kind of topography that we have, um, there, there, there were generators at some of these other locations at one point in time. Right, so Walcott was 
the primary power source for the original Hardwick Electric Department. And Hardwick Electric coupled their system with the Morrisville Water and Light System, which had multiple hydro stations as well. And we operated our systems in parallel and utilized the rivers in the water because we were the first one upstream uh, together to try uh, our best to supply power to all our ratepayers 24 hours a day. The other three dams, uh, Mackville, Nichols Pond, and East Long Pond, were all part of the Woodbury Granite operations in the late 1890s and through about 1920. And in 1947, Green Mountain Power ended up selling, they owned them at that point in time, they picked them up in the 20s, and they ended up uh, selling them to Hardwick Electric, uh, primarily because the hydro facility that's behind our warehouse, uh, which is the one Vince was interested in resurrecting, as was I, um, was part of that purchase. And it was a great facility and made a lot of power and uh, GMP had no interest in trying to serve Hardwick Electric or our customers. We were already here. And, uh, but anyway, those three ended up with us through that. And Caspian was picked up, as I recall, in the 30s. Uh, we picked up that dam and all the water rights down through the village um, for potential hydro generation, but that was never built, never came to fruition. Um, I had one other question on the casualty coverage, which was on the medical payments. Yep. So <clears throat> it is if, if someone, <clears throat> the pedestrian was hit by one of our trucks, mm -hmm. are we limited to $15,000 in coverage? No, I mean, that, that would be, that's a liability claim. So, I mean, you know, that, you know, you have 10 million in limits there. And where, where is the, let me just, where's the liability coverage on, on the, on this declarations page? I'm not seeing it at all then. Well, it's an under section three casualty coverage, $10 million, any one occurrence including SOTS brought into connection therewith, combined single limit for all casualty under sections three agreements C, D, and E, except following loss types are sublimited. So what is the medical payments if it, if it then that's, that's limited? That's a good question. Vicki, yeah. do you know what that is? Well, it's only it only applies to elected officials and volunteers, but we have that volunteer coverage now for you know, the accident. Oh policy yes, for volunteers. So that I think is probably the primary. And then I don't know if we ever use the medical payments coverage that's in the passive coverage document now that we have the accident policy. Yeah, that's true. So so to clarify, we we have. We have a, a, a we purchase an AD and D policy for all volunteers, and um, and so in that particular case, that that provides up to fifty thousand um, dollars in medical. And it used to be that that was kind of excess over the person's health insurance, but now it's primary, so they're not tapping your health insurance. So there's fifty thousand dollars of benefits for that. But if a third party was injured, you know, that and somebody filed suit, that, that's a general liability claim and you have $10 million limit there. Okay, and, and, and that, so that limit on, on medical doesn't apply. No, that's not for that situation. It's kind of more what Vicki described yeah. and, and she's right that really that limit does never comes into play because people, we have the volunteer uh, coverage for volunteers and elected officials. And so that people use the higher limit coverage first and it never, you know, we never even pay out on the 15,000 medical payments. You can't get both. Uh, I don't know that anybody's ever tried actually, so I can't say that, but uh, um, 
but yeah, you're, if there's a third party suit, then it's automatically, you know, you've got that 10 million um, standing for you. So that 15,000 should be cross-referenced under the, under section five someplace? I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering, otherwise there's no, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying, what it is, but there's no written description of actually what it is. No, um, and I'd have to look in the coverage document to see yeah. what, what's referenced because this is just, you know, this is kind of like your cheat sheet to your limits, the coverage document kind of rules. Um, yeah. Okay. So it yeah, it is in the coverage document on page 68. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and as is the case with any of these, you know, the the declaration page kind of gives you your limits, but to kind of tell you when and how and, and under what circumstances each thing applies, you really have to go to the coverage language. Okay, got it. I see it. Um, so Lynn, did you have any anything else on the casualty thing? No, no, that, that was okay. that was that was it. I, I just had not had a chance to try and trace that through. So thank you. Okay. Um, and, and I if just have a fun. curiosity question, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> so in general, um, for example, Lindenville Electric is very similar to us. They, they got hydros, etc. Yeah. Is there a kind of a generic bundle that you provide to munis and it is hardwick electric significantly different uh in any category is there any category that we should be looking at where we should get some more coverage that you know of well i mean so that's a good question and and i was wondering if you you were going to ask that and i think we're we're at a little disadvantage because um Lindenville electric has and they always had for years all of their other coverages with like that, whatever it's like a New England power pool insurance association Napa. or captive, yeah. And and so we we didn't we never had them. All we ever had was the workers comp. And um, so now you know we passive technically we we coordinate Lindenville's workers comp, but we don't even actually take on that risk. We're placing their workers comp in the assigned risk for for the village because they're under the Lindenville, under the village's coverage. Um, so they're not an individual member per se. They're kind of sliding along under the Lindenville village's membership. Um, so I really can't tell you that. I mean, I think, uh, let's see, Morrisville Water, the, really it's Morrisville Village, but operates as Water and Light. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we have them. But I'm trying to think, I don't think we have, you know, I don't know that we have all of their coverages either. I'm trying to remember if we do or not. Um, oh, Morrisville Water and Light? Yeah. We, um, trying to think too, I, th I don't think we have their property coverage. That's what I think, yeah. yeah. I think we have everything but their property. Correct, yeah. Um, so, I mean, about, I think the one thing that, I mean, I know from our coverage, there's, um, there's failure to supply exclusions. So, you know, if there's some event that causes um, Hardwick Electric to not be able to supply power to its customers and a customer has a loss because they can't, you know, produce widgets or whatever it is, um, you know, they might, they could say, oh, well, it's you, the village, that's Hardwick Electric's liability. And so we don't provide coverage for that, um, just usually because those things are kind of related to act of God. But really, the on the other side of the equation, um, business owners have the ability to get utility interruption coverage. And typically, their agents are going to advise that they do that because they know that most commercial policies have... Um, have that kind of a, a failure to supply exclusion. So, you know, I don't know that it's it's a huge risk. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. I mean, obviously we supply, there's smaller water districts that we supply, um, some fire districts and so forth. But I mean, uh, we Barton Village, I mean, we have them. Do, 
Mike, do we have in our terms of service, I know a lot of utilities have this, but I don't know whether we have it in our terms of service or not, that limits our, our liability um, for loss in the event of, of, of an outage? I've never, I, I don't know that I can speak to that specifically, but I know that uh, I've never heard of any utility in Vermont having any liability from an outage, whether it was an hour or 10 days for them to get the power back on. Right. Um, and I know, for example, um, Orlean, Barton and Orleans Electric both share a substation up in Barton. So all their customers are served through that one substation. And somebody was kind enough to shoot a hole in the side of it. And uh, it ended up blowing up. And it took, I think, five or six days to get a mobile transformer to Vermont to get them back in service. And neither one of them had any liability from that. Yeah, they, I mean, had, they had no liability or, or, or nobody claimed this, this. Well, I know I spoke to John about it at length. He's the manager there at Orleans and they, I was worried about that, and that's why I was inquiring. And he said, "No, we, we there's no liability because they didn't have an act of um, a negligent act, or you know, they didn't do something stupid out of the equation that caused the failure." Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we can we can we can we can check um, sure. with with the, with our legal advisors as to whether we have liability or not. And under what circumstances? Um, and if you decide it's you, you, you want to pursue some, you know, failure to, failure to supply coverage. I mean, you, I think there. And again, I'm not sure whether that New England Association, you know, might offer it or not. The folks at Lindenville Electric could tell you that. Um, I could certainly check with our alternative market. You know, Mike, if that was something the board decided they wanted to pursue. Okay. So, so just so VLTC. There's some coverages that you provide, and there are others where you, in essence, act as a broker. Is, is well, I think we we provide actually very comprehensive coverages for Vermont municipalities, but we also have the ability to go out and get other coverages as members might need or request, or to try to seek specialty coverages, because you know all, I don't want to say one size fits all, but um, the coverage that we've kind of put together really ve meets the needs of Vermont municipalities in general. Occasionally, certain members will feel, well, gee, we, we might want some more coverage on this, or maybe we want higher cyber limits. So then we'll facilitate that. In the case of cyber limits, that's pretty easy for us to get because we can, we can work with uh, our, our, our broker who places our reinsurance and just work with that same cyber reinsurer to get those. In other cases, we have to go to an external broker who we, we do work with a couple of them and can try to get placements on your behalf. Okay. Thank you. So we, we do that as a service to you just to try to make it you know, easier for you to, to have options. I mean, you're, you're certainly welcome to, to chat with other agents or whatever and other folks in the industry, but I mean, we're happy to do some legwork for you. Uh, okay, so uh, I think the first question, it said, for the purposes of the insurance or commissions, officials, employees, volunteers, um, are, are they officials, employees, volunteers, or something else was the first question. And so I think, you know, we would consider uh, members of the governing body would typically be officials. And so you're not, you're not employees, you're not covered by workers' compensation. Uh, we don't collect any workers' compensation contribution for you. Um, so you would be, you know, considered as uh, officials um, in general. As far as what falls within the commissioner's scope of duties for purposes of coverage, I mean, it's a pretty broad question, but I think really anything that is in the range of tasks that directly relate to the performance of your duties as a commissioner would, would be within the scope of duties. Um, and then you're and kind of relating to the public officials liability, the, 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 the types of claims that we get for public officials liability, just so you can kind of get an appreciation. Um, it's things like 
um, like improper land transactions, or let me read a couple descriptions here to you. Um, you know, plaintiff alleges issue with voter registration, obviously not an issue, a declaratory judgment, failure to war, where to warn of tax sale. Um, let's see, plaintiff alleges failure to pay for services, breach of contract. Uh, let's see, claimant injured from alleged ADA zoning violations, uh, delinquent tax sales. So it's, it's kind of like a wrongful act that a member of the governing body or board member does unintentionally. And it's kind of like we, oh, we made a mistake in, in the execution of our duties. So, I mean, there's usually, there's, there's no bodily injury per se, but somebody is damaged in the sense that they were deprived some right, they were harmed financially by a decision that was made by the board. So that's kind of the type of thing that public officials liability is designed to protect you against. And then the other things like a third party sues you because they slipped and fell on your parking lot type, types of events, that's a general liability. And so that falls under the kind of the, the section three casualty coverage. So it's kind of everything is split up into kind of its own little block of coverages. And then kind of skipping down to like one of the last questions um, or the last question it was talking about the exclusions. Please explain the exclusion 20 and 21. So in public affairs, because we offer um, those coverages else, elsewhere, like you know, employee benefits or employment practice liability, we exclude them from public officials liability because we don't want to be responsible for somebody to collect under one coverage and then come under with from the same thing, collect under a different coverage. So you kind of have to isolate it. You're entitled to one compensation. And so you kind of have to apportion those off and exclude things from other coverages. So you just don't have those duplicate, you know, people don't have access to two sets of limits. And that's why that's done, if that makes sense to you. But um, where, where, where in the policy does it say that the commissioners, as opposed to Hardwick Electric as, a, as an entity, are covered um, if someone is injured and, and they just start suing everybody? You know, they, someone is injured um, because of downstream from a dam and, and they say you should have the dam should have been repaired. They sue Hardwick Electric. They sue uh, the commissioners individually. So yeah, so that's where you're 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 part. You're under the member. So in actually, sorry, I'm looking at the public officials coverage, but where it says named member, that typically would be construed. And I think there's a a section probably in section one that describes that. Um, maybe it's even under definitions, Vicki, but. Um, Hardwick Electric Department is the named member, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. And so the member would be, the member could be an employee, the member could be a board member. So anyone doing the business on behalf of the named member. It could be, it could even be a volunteer, an authorized volunteer, potentially. You know, God forbid, you have a volunteer, they have a truck and they back over somebody. They're, they're a volunteer for, say, a town. In that kind of situation, the municipality, the entity is protected. Now, we're probably, I don't know if we're going to cover the volunteer, but maybe we would because they're, you know, performing duties on behalf of the name member. As long as it's authorized duties, then there's probably coverage. So uh, it, it does say it, uh, in section four, paragraph 12, under official. And that means any natural person while in the named member service. Exactly. So that's, a, it's not called out specifically, but I mean, it's, it, you know, that's the nature of these darn insurance documents. And, you know, believe me, this one's probably easier to read than most. Um, but yeah, you have to hop all over the place within the document 
and reference all those different sections to try to sort it out. So I, I can certainly appreciate, you know, your questions. That's why we're having this discussion. Absolutely. Um, now, the wonderful thing about America is anybody can sue anybody, regardless of what the insurance policy says. So I think there needs to be something in the agreement that says Hardwick Electrical hold harmless the commissioners and it'll be covered by the company insurance to both defend and pay any claims uh, on behalf of the commissioners. Because without anything that protects us, anybody could sue us regardless of what the insurance says. Well, yeah, they can, but you, you, you're you protected as, as an agent of Hardwick Electric is what I'm saying. As long, for anything that you do on behalf of Hardwick Electric, there is coverage. Well, there's coverage in case there's a there's a claim that someone says, okay, well, here's, here's the claim that we're going to settle on. But what about the defense of the claim? Yeah, that's covered. It's covered? No, yeah. Up to the up to the limit of the of 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 the coverage. Yeah, what that's included in the limit. Yeah. And, uh, it looks like um, former board members who may be sued because they may have been on the board at the time after a certain period uh, don't have coverage under the extended reporting period. Um, yeah, but there's a section in there that I think that talks about basically if, if it relates back to, to a time when, when you did the work, um, then there potentially then there is coverage and I'd have to find that spot in there, but I'm pretty sure there's something in there. It's, a, it's a, right under, it's a claims made coverage, but it, there still appears to be what I can, uh, looks like a 36 month time limit. I, actually that, that needs a supplemental extended reporting period. Uh, and there's an additional contribution for that. Right, but that doesn't, it, you know, if something happened years ago and you just find out about today and it was because of the action of a board member from 10 years ago I mean, assuming we say it's within the statute of limitations. Seven years, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, there's gonna be coverage for that. Okay. But, but our, 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 all of us at some time will cease to be. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and let's say that, that there's a claim made when we're no longer. Correct. Does this insurance still cover us? Yeah, I mean, so, so absolutely. So, you know, you, you're retired and you haven't been on the board for five years and somebody you know discovers or they're harmed by something then then yeah the coverage is going to come into effect for the for for that is is again it's claims made coverage so we're going to find out about it it's reported within you know reported now and so okay well yeah they did these acts this again it's within the you know we go through the whole investigation process but yeah the coverage is there because you think about it if it's not there you know, why does anybody want to serve as a public official? Right. Um, I mean, so, so yeah, it's absolutely there. As, as for the, the sovereign immunity exclusion, uh, this is, wouldn't be related to your coverage, but I guess Mike or, or Lynn, do you know anything? It was uh, sovereign immunity, sovereign immunity um, would be Right, but so, so I guess I, I know what it is. I'm, I'm just thinking about somebody can still file suit and there's still costs associated with defending yourself. Yep. Even though, even if it's thrown out. Yes. And and that's there's a lot of our claims where that happens. You know, law enforcement claims, you get an officer that worked there years ago, as long as it's within the statute of limitations and they file a, you know, excessive force or a violation of civil rights or something like that. Yeah, of course. We ended up defending the officer, and if, if the officer is named individually, and we defend the municipality, okay. And so we'll defend okay. them, and then if if in fact upon adjudication of the claim, there's actually a settlement and, and a loss paid, we do we both pay the defense, we pay the loss. Sometimes it involves even paying plaintiffs' attorneys' fees, whatever it is. So well, but I think I think the question I don't want to put words into Vince's mouth, but I think the question that he's asking is there's an exclusion in 5B number four says that the coverage does not apply for loss or damage 
or any liability arising out of or in connection with the performance of governmental functions by members to which sovereign immunity applies. Right. So what that means is if we're able to use the sovereign immunity defense to defend and, and rebut, rebut the claim, well, then, you know, we're not going to pay a claim because we were able to successfully defend it from sovereign immunity. So it's not really an, an exclusion. It's an exclusion for the, for the, the uh, uh, plaintiff. Yes, it's, it's loss or damage. It doesn't say anything about defense. We're going to defend it. Hopefully we win. And then, sorry, you lose. It's sovereign, defendity, the sovereign defense. You know, the judge said, yep, you know, summary judgment based on sovereign immunity. Okay. We're done. Yeah. So that's what that means. Fun stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. And then the car, the question about the car accidents. Um, so again, you're not an employee, so there's no workers' compensation coverage. Um, coverage would typically be afforded through your own auto policy, or if the other person's at fault through their auto policy, and that would be for your vehicle uh, and any bodily injuries. Um, if Passive does provide, let's say you're at fault and um, you know it's a $3 million claim, somebody's a paraplegic and you have a $300,000 liability on your insurance policy. Well, it pay, you'll pay out policy limits on your policy and then will be excess over that to, to because you were acting on behalf of the member. So we're gonna protect you and the municipality in that instance. So our coverage will come in excess of your policy limits and pay whatever the amount. So our insurance, our own individual insurance is primary. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. Does that also apply on liability? On well, liability for, coverage? For, for, for auto liability. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, other other liability to the extent that, that, that we may have a general liability. Umbrella or something. Umbrella policy. Oh, for your for your person, you mean? No, yeah. I mean, if you're acting on behalf. If you're acting, if you're you're performing your duties as you know, in the scope of your duties as a as a commissioner, then then obviously that's what our insurance is for. So that's primary. We're going to be primary there. You can what you have is irrelevant. We're going to protect you and the member. Well, but if we're going, if if we if we have to make a site visit to. Uh, a station or go to a, a meeting that's also in the performance of our duties. Yep, that is. So, so a general auto is different, a little different because it's an auto. There's, there's another coverage. And, and so that's, that one comes into play first. But like I said, your personal limits will come into play first. If those are exhausted, then we come in. Okay. So that's kind of how that works because auto is a little different than general liability. It's one of the quirks um, of auto policies. I, there's a, let's see, 5B number five. It says for any loss which represents cost, civil fine, penalty, or expense levied or imposed against any member arising from complaint or enforcement action from any federal, state, or local government regulatory agency. So yeah. would you be able to just explain that a little bit? Uh, well, I think that that, that essentially means that if there's a federal, state, or lo local, or governmental regulatory agency that levies some sort of a fine, then that's not insurable. We're not responsible for that. So, you know, they kind of expanded cost, civil fine, penalty, or expense. But basically, if, if some agency is saying, oh, you polluted whatever, or you know, you damage the rivers of X, Y, and Z, or cause fish kill and fines you 25 grand, that's not covered okay. it it vince is in terms of electric utility regulation it is highly unlikely highly unlikely that there would be any government agency fining commissioners i mean you'd, you'd, you'd it would have to be a case where a commissioner has taken some kind of egregious action on their own or where the commissioners collectively did something okay right it's not You're, like somebody blanket filing suit against everybody they can find no, no, the, no. This is this is where the government does something. Is the way I, 
Fred, is that correct? This is yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. This, the not, this is not. This is not where where a third party is suing H E D and sues all the commissioners as well. Right. This is this is this is where the P U C, um, or or FERC or or A N R or somebody levies a fine. Um, yeah, or, I think that's exactly what it is. Yep. And the, the number seven for claims rising from procurement, construction, or architect or engineer contract. So say, for example, an engineering firm submits a bid and they lose the contract and they sue Hardwick Electric and the members, um, that wouldn't be covered. Is that right? If um, I, don't, I don't, I couldn't tell you, it would depend on the circumstances of the situation. I mean, I, I don't know that I can say yes or no on that one. Uh, probably there's no coverage, but it's possible that there is. So I, I can't really give you a definitive on that one. It, it would it would depend on the nuance of the situation. I can tell you. Um, well, that's sorry. No, I was going to say something, but it relates to uh, the general liability where there's there's uh, in section three there's an exclusion that relates to um, a lot of contracts will required in the states you know does this a lot where they kind of will try to push the municipality to accept responsibility for the state's engineering uh, drawings architectural drawings and design of bridges and whatever when they do these quick projects and you know in reality we have exclusions for that so we won't offer any coverage in those situations but i would say you're probably right on number seven um you know if if arising from the procurement, construction, or architect or engineer contracts. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's probably no coverage. I'm, I, I was very concerned. This was one that I was very concerned about mm -hmm. um, because I've, I've, I've seen cases where, you know, there've been dis disputes under um, contracts for power plants or power purchase agreements um, and, The way I read this is is that we have no coverage that we is you know for for this that if there's a claim made against a, a commissioner for for tortious interference for um, breach of contract if it deals with <clears throat> excuse me a procurement contract which a power purchase agreement would be or um, if if we decided to to build our own power plant or we hired somebody to do construction on some part of the system um, and there was a claim arising under that contract that's excluded from this coverage it's yeah potentially well I think there's there's the other one what was the other one you asked about um, contracts where where there's the exclusion where the heck was it? Some sort of an exclusion. Oh, let me look at my. Breach. Oh. Which question was it? Uh, see, it wasn't a breach of contract. Oh, breach of contract. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, we we don't we don't really offer breach of contract coverage per se. I mean, we have we've had claims, and you would file a claim. Um, and we'll do some investigation. It's possible that there could be some initial defense while we're trying to understand what really went on. But once it comes to, I mean, I was looking at some of them under public officials and there's a couple of them that say breach of contract and we spent $375. So we, you know, we did some either initial legal review or whatever, a lot of breach of contracts. I mean, I'm more familiar, not familiar with, with power purchase contracts, but a lot of say construction contracts and the like, you know, usually there's in the contract language, there's there's specific language that talks about how to remedy potential breaches and it gives a party 30 days to do this and that. And so that's where you, you have the opportunity to try to come to an amicable agreement. And so I'm thinking that it could be that the theory is, is that that these are kind of largely avoidable. Now, there could be situations where counsel is telling you, 
well, you're right, and we, we need to get out of this contract. They're, they're giving you legal advice to do that. And then counsel on the other side is saying, well, we got them, we need to go, and then there's going to be a battle. Um, and, you know, is it really breach of contract or not? And so, I mean, I think all I can say is that we'd have to look at the individual situation and determine whether there's coverage or not. But I, I think at face value, I don't believe that there is. But what, and what about if customers brought suit claiming that we wrongly entered into a contract that we shouldn't have, that it was too expensive, that it was too whatever? Um, this exclusion, again, looks to me like we don't have coverage for that. Yeah, I would think that there's probably no coverage there either. That's concern. That's a real concern. Yeah. Because that's the most likely place where that I can see where 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 customers would say, "Hey, you commissioners screwed up." Well, you know, but then then that really does kind of start to get into you know, what's the issue? If did you make a mistake and made an improper decision that is, you know, involved or causes some party or party's damages. And then that's what public officials liability is for, but that's different than breach of contract. So you, the breach of contract piece. I no, no, I, 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 I said, this is different. I agree okay, with you. Okay, okay. It, uh, I'm not, yeah. but it's still, it's still, the language is so broad in seven in that exclusion that claims arising from could be Claims arising from a contract that was executed, in other words, a breach of contract that involving a breach of that contract, yeah. or it could be a claim arising from having entered into a contract brought by by customers. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really I, I can't give you a definitive answer, but my my gut tells me that if somebody is alleging that you made an error into the decision-making process in one way or the other, then that's exactly what this coverage is designed to do. So somebody is saying, you made the wrong decision. That's what I, this I, coverage is I, here I, for. I hear you. <clears throat> but it would seem to me that 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 the insurance company is, you know, or VLTC is, has the ability to say, hey, wait a second. Yeah, but this, this, is, this, is, this was a procurement decision. This was from entering into a procurement contract. And this is, that's a claim arising from that and, and we're not covering. And, and I, I'm trying to understand how we get comfortable with this. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I mean all I can tell you is that in general, the philosophy, I mean, we, we, we're not like a for-profit insurance company where we can, we're only gonna absolutely pay the claims that we have to. I mean, we try to find coverage for members. I mean, and that's, that's a fact. Um, so, you know, that's my first thought. And, you know, I think, you know, the, if you read like the definition of wrongful act, so, it means any actual or alleged violation of federal, state, or local, or civil rights, breach of duty by the member in the discharge of duties for the named member individually or collectively. So that's really the intent of the coverage. But I, I do hear you with regard to the exclusion. It does kind of put into question mm -hmm. in that scenario. Would, would uh, depending on the nature of the procurement construction or, or any one of these contracts, mm -hmm. some may come under uh, the description of some may come under sovereign immunity. So if that was the case, would uh, would VLCT? I don't, I, um, you know, we can, we can talk to our council as to what, okay. how sovereign immunity applies. My guess is it doesn't. Um, I, I think that, um, it would d depend on the contract. 
we're operating as a commercial entity and sovereign immunity applies, generally speaking, I don't know about Vermont law per se, but in most jurisdictions, sovereign immunity applies to governmental acts when acting in a governmental capacity, not in a commercial capacity. And what we're doing is commercial. We're not, we're not making laws. Right. We're, not, we're not enforcing laws. This is, a, this is a commercial enterprise that's owned by the government. This is good. This is I mean, because, Vince, Vince, when I represent developers of, of power projects, okay, uh, in, in lots of different countries, okay, there's always a clause in there, in, in the contract, because the, typically the utility who's the off taker of the power, so the Hardwick Electric, if you will, is owned by the government of whatever country it is. Um, and, and there'll be something in there that says that this is commercial, you know, that sovereign immunity doesn't apply. Um, and, and it's belt and braces because if sovereign immunity did apply, saying it doesn't apply doesn't make it not apply. Um, but it, it's um, usually sovereign immunity doesn't apply to commercialized. But I think, I think we can find out from, um, from our council. Um, yeah, I mean, there were some recent court cases on that and the Supreme Court, Vermont Supreme Court um, issued some clarification on how that applies. I think it was related to a decision that the city of Rutland made uh, with regard to whether to expand a, a, a waste storm drain or not. And you know they have funding limitations and other issues that come into play as a public entity and the boards make funding decisions and budget decisions as best they can. And I think the, the nuts and bolts was that the court found that it was actually covered under sovereign immunity. It was a claim that we had that our, our defense defended. So, but, but your counsel would probably be, um, could refer to that and might be able to infer some logic from that case. It was about maybe, um, the decision was issued probably about a year ago, I think. Um, and I'm sorry, I wish I could remember the actual citation, but I don't. But it was it involved the city of Rutland. Yeah. Um, we can we can we can we can check with 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 our council on that as to what well, the. Okay. You know, maybe, maybe it gives us more protection than 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 I would have expected. Well, and and on our side, I'm happy to. Um, you know, just kind of take this back and bat this around with our management team to just kind of discuss some of the scenarios that you outlined and whether we feel that there would be coverage or not. Um, in particular, I would talk to, probably talk to the director, but also to our, our property and casualty claims manager, because she's been doing this for 25 years. And um, I don't think, you know, I, I know that there's probably situations where this clause has come into play and so it would be good to have a little round table on it. So we'll, we'll um, happily do that and get back to you on that. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, let's see, where are we here? So four, um, claim has to be reported in 30 days, otherwise um, the fund is substantially prejudiced. What's the meaning and effect of the phrase substantial prejudice? So I think this is, to me, this was a, a pretty simple answer. Basically, it's just an acknowledgement to the member that the delayed reporting places the fund in an adverse position relative to adjudicating the claim. So as such, it could affect the outcome of the claim in terms of the dollar value, how much we pay, our ability to defend, et cetera. Um, there is no effect on your coverage or your limits. So there's like no penalty. It's just kind of saying, hey, you know, report them to you as soon as you, uh, to us as soon as you can, because otherwise it just kind of puts us in this kind of potentially in adverse position trying to defend the claim. Yeah, except that's not what it's what it said. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, says the fund is su substantially prejudiced, and that's all it says. It doesn't indicate nowhere in the coverage document is there any indication that there's a consequence for that prejudice. Yeah. So that's what I'm selling you is that there's, it's, it's saying that we're, we are, and we are substantially prejudiced. In other words, 
it could affect the outcome of the claim. It could affect how much it costs. Now, is it, you know, it well, could it affect- say, I, Yeah, it doesn't say maybe substantially prejudiced. It said- that, Right, right. You know, well, so the, and that's 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 what set my antenna. Up. I got you. I got you. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a semantics thing, but I think that's what the intent is. Um, probably not in every situation are we prejudiced. I mean, I think we are prejudiced from the perspective of you know the time sensitivity and people's memories and being able to recall events. But you know, is that substantial or not? Um, but at the end of the day, it has no net impact on your coverage or your limits. Then why is it in there? I, just going back to liability insurance for architects and engineers, if you don't alert the insurance company about a potential claim within a certain period of time, you're yeah. totally not covered. Yeah. So, you, so many times, if you don't tell us by then, and you tell back, we're not going to cover you. So to have something in there that doesn't really do anything is just a a sense of confusion. <laughs> well, you know, I, I kind of agree with that. I think it, it my, my guess is, I didn't write it, but my guess is, is that um, it's probably some sort of standard, standard language that we adapted when we drafted it. And um, I think its intent was just to merely to communicate to members that the, the urgency and, and the need for reporting and, you know, if it does more than that, you know, then, you know, I apologize for that. You know, it's something we could conceivably look at next year when we do our rewrite. Um, let's see, number five. Is, the is it something, is it something, Fred, you could consider removing, period? <laughs> I mean, um, we can consider it. I mean, we, our coverage is done for the year. We've already done our filing. So for 2021, um, DFR is reviewing that, uh, you know, as we speak and the board has already approved it. Um, so it would be, it would be something for 2022 coverage. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we start the process in May, June of every year and it takes us three months to get it nailed down. So, um, we can certainly take a look at the section. Um, so number five, uh, does the fund have the right to admit HED's guilt? <clears throat> I mean, we don't, I don't think we've ever admit any guilt. I mean, first of all, and, and um, if, if something goes to court and there's a court decision, well, then the court decision stand on, stands on its own. Um, the vast majority of claims result in settlements and in those settlements, uh, because they're they're civil matters, they're not criminal. There's there's no there is no guilt admission. The fact that you've settled the claim just says, okay, well, we're saying that we have this liability, and and we agree that this is a reasonable to to close out that liability. Guilt was probably the wrong word, but an admission of liability. Well, I mean, no, there's no formal of admission of liability in anything, in any settlement that we do that I'm aware of. Okay. You know, we, we, we agree, yes, we come to agree that, you know, we will provide this level of compensation for you and, you know, sign the papers and on we go. Um, let's see, exactly what personal injuries are excluded from coverage. Well, I think that refers to the... Um, if you're talking about kind of as I talked in the beginning, if you're talking about under the public officials liability section, so that's excluded because the personal injuries are covered under the casualty section under general liability, third party personal injuries. So that's that would be the answer for that one. Um, but but it's still it still covers not just HED, it covers the commissioners as well. Right, you're, yep, because you're, you, you're a member. You're, you're, you're considered the member, yep. HED is the name member. Okay. So any, any official action that you take with regard to your duties as an HED commissioner, there's coverage for general liability, there's coverage for public officials liability, um, and so for personal injuries though, and I'd have to review the, 
the public officials, what, what does it specifically say about, it's really more for like wrongful acts. It's not a matter of personal injury. Somebody might have damages um, or as, you know, felt like their rights were violated or have some sort of a financial loss, but it's not for like bodily kind of personal injuries, if you will. I don't know if that helps, but um, any other questions on that one? I think we covered seven breach of contract. Uh, under VB19, can the fund claim that they don't have to cover a claim that would otherwise be covered against a commissioner because the commissioner doesn't have personal liability insurance? Um, I think the, the exclusion is really intended to address a situation where a member as an entity knows that they need insurance and do not obtain it. There's there's no requirement for you to obtain insurance individually. Um, you know, you, you should have auto insurance because that's required by law. Um, but um, there's nothing that says that you need personal liability insurance to cover you for your commissioner duties. And, you know, that's the whole point of our coverage is to protect you, give you the public officials coverage for all of your actions as a, a, a member of this board. So is, is, that, is there something to that effect cross-referenced in, in another section of the document or is there earlier language that supersedes this? Because I could see rewording this pretty easily. So it wasn't, uh, if there wasn't any of that uh, clarifying language to say what you just said, because that does, I mean, you know, it, uh, insurance of any kind, if you don't have insurance of any kind, um, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, let me just see uh, which which exclusion was that? Uh, 19. 19. 19. Yeah, there we go. So let me go back to the beginning. Let's see. Does that apply? On page eighty eight, if that helps. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm just wanted to see what the heading of of it. Yeah, as a result of failure or omission of the member to to effect or maintain any insurance of any kind. Yeah, I mean, I, I am hard pressed to think of a scenario where that could come into play. But, you know, I, my gut tells me it relates to something that you would be legally required to have insurance for, but yet don't. And of course, I mean, we're giving you, you know, a lot of different coverages. There might be... Um, you know, everything from employee benefits, we got your employees covered, your vehicles covered, your property covered, your liability covered, covered your, your public officials acts covered. Um, so I think it's kind of like, in the event there's something we missed that's required, um, then there's no coverage. But I, I honestly, I am not quite sure otherwise what that would mean. I mean, frankly, if, if this is saying that you need to have auto insurance or legally required insurance, that's what it should say. Right. Yeah, but I agree not, with that. But that's not what it says. It says yeah. of any kind. I have insurance on my coin collection. Is that adequate? Uh, but, but, but again, I, I mean, I think the thing that jumps to mind is, is, is to say, well, you don't have adequate uh, personal liability coverage. And if you had, that would have, that would have been primary, blah, 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 or whatever. Um, or some other coverage that I can't think of off the top of my head now, but um, I mean, is this something that we can get out, you know, removed from the 2021 no. or clarified? No. I mean, you know, I, 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 can, I can go back and, and Vicki, I don't know, maybe make some notes. We have the other one that we were just talking about that we're, I think it was maybe number seven, but um, but also this one, we can go back this one around and, and maybe try to get some examples of where it might apply because that might make you more comfortable. Um, but for the life of me, I can't necessarily think some, but I would be willing to bet that our claims manager has come up with some scenarios in, in her experience of adjudicating claims. So we're happy to do that. Uh, but no, I don't think we can, we, we can't pull it out um, for this year's coverage. You but, but, can have a, a, a subsequent ad, an, an addendum, though, that would clarify it. Uh, that well, would, anything that doesn't reduce coverage, I think you can, anyway. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that that what I'm willing to do is is to go back and, and kind of bat it around internally and give you some feedback and a written opinion as to what it is. Right. And so, OK, right. And, and then, you know, if, if the, you still have some concerns after that, well, then, you know, we can talk. Roger, did you have a question? You... Just trying to see if there are any other. I ones. do not. Thanks, Lynn. You know, and I would agree that um, in general that there's, you know, as you have read, uh, you know, this is a fairly extensive document and we've got, you know, the cyber coverage one is not this long, but 25 pages. Um, so there's a lot of text there and a lot of insurance language. And so I, every year we go through and we clean up wording and phrasing and um, revise things. And it's like, well, why is that there? And, and so we, you know, that's kind of what we do. That's the process every year. And so be just, you know, in the back of your mind, I mean, I certainly appreciate and do understand your concerns. But remember, we are a member owned organization. So it's not like your standard insurance company that's out to put the screws to you, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we are you, we work for you. We are owned by our municipal members. So when there's ambiguities in coverage, I mean, we're gonna try to find coverage for you whenever we can. So I think, you know, just keep that in mind as, you, as your overriding principle, but all that said, we'll certainly, um, you know, we'll certainly have some internal discussions about the two items that we talked about. And um, Mike, I'm happy to get back to you with an email to kind of give you some more information and outline some of those issues and hopefully some, some more clarifications for folks. Um, so that was the list of questions. Um, is there anything else insurance that's on your mind? Did we make progress? Is our thing? Are you feeling a little better about some things? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the, just having better clarity is great. I had zero knowledge going into this process, so you filled the you filled the void. I mean, you may you may think that ten million dollars of general liability coverage it sounds like a big number. Um, but you know, in this day and age of nuclear verdicts and, um, it doesn't sound like a big net. Well, that's one of the things that I'm concerned about both yeah. for, for, for HED and for the, the commissioners. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I worked for an electric utility, um, many years ago in the 1980s um, and there was there was a case where someone climbed a fence like a 10-foot fence that was around a substation mm. that had signs all over it about high voltage danger all this kind of stuff and they got electrocuted and there was a huge judgment. Uh, California or New York? <laughs> Illinois. Oh, well, okay, that's the other one. <laughs> um, and, um, hmm. you know, we have, we have transformers and substations and other things where, you know, you, you, you know there are people who do foolish and stupid things sometimes that have nothing to do with whether or not HED has taken every precaution that it should have taken. Um, so I guess one follow-up question that I have, um, and maybe Mike, you already have this information, is what do we pay for the different coverages? What would it cost if we increased some of those coverages? Well, um, we can we can tell you what you pay for the general liability portion. I think we can break that out, or you know, I don't know, Vicky can do it right now, but we can certainly tell you that. Um, I think 
if you wanted to look a couple things about, say, just general liability. Say you wanted to expand on that, or you wanted to pursue a, kind of an umbrella um, that would attach at 10 million and maybe take you to 20 million. And it might apply to uh, general liability, auto liability, and public officials liability or something. Um, we could try to find, it, it would be something that passive um, would, would not do. It's not part of our um, reinsurance. You know, we're, we're reinsured up to 10 million. So that, you know, when you start getting up into high limits like that, you get into low probabilities, but for the capacity, especially in this day and age, you know, liability suits have gone up. Um, and, you know, for utilities, just think about like PG&E with, you know, their transformers and whatnot starting fires and what, you know, hundred of million and they're looking at going out of business with, with some of those types almost going into bankruptcy. Um, you know, so those kinds of situations, there, there, there is liability, um, but we could, we could try to see if we could find some type of an umbrella policy that would take you from where our coverage ends to, you know, pick a number, 20 million. Um, we, we could certainly try to do that for you if that was something that the, you know, the board was interested in. I, I, I personally would, you know, I don't know how other commissioners feel about it, but I, 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 I think the more information that we have, the more information that Mike has, the better decisions that we can make. Um, and, you know, I, I can see from the declarations page that our total cost is 38,000 and change. But I have no idea how that breaks out for the different coverages, mm -hmm. or as I say, what additional coverages might, um, whether it's, it's, whether it's additional coverages, or whether it's higher limits. Yeah, it's probably going to be higher just, limits. Yeah, that we or have. An umbrella. <clears throat> um, and and I think that would be useful information. So I, <clears throat> pardon me, Fred, if you could get us kind of that summary and close out those follow ups that you said you could take back and bat around, that would be great for us to have along with the document we've all been looking at here tonight for us to have a conversation next month or maybe the month after with our council mm -hmm. and we can go from there. Does that sound reasonable, Lynn? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, I think we, there's some discrete questions that we could, can, can ask our, our council. I'm not sure that it even rises to the level where we'll need to have a meeting. I think it depends on what comes back as, 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 as answers. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm also jutting in here because I'm trying to move us along because I know Sean has other commitments tonight and it is 630. OK. OK, well, I can commit to um, uh, Mike, we can get you something, I would say. Um, I, I don't know if it'll be this week, but uh, but, it, you know, certainly before Thanksgiving can get you something in writing. And then did you want us to kind of check? for um to see what you know, other umbrella coverage might cost just so you can consider that or the availability Absolutely. Of that. Yes. yes okay we will do that okay uh vince michael nat you any other questions before we close out this discussion no i think we've covered a lot okay well we we thank you for the opportunity to chat and um mike will we'll get that off to you and we'll go from there Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you for thanks coming. to Fred and Vicky, both of yeah. you. Much Vicky, appreciated. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Bye Good now. Night. John. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Uh, oh, there you so are. Uh -huh. we could, we're going to have to kind of get off the agenda here for a minute and go to him, I think. Well, okay. What's your time frame here, Sean? Well, I'm at the back end of Johnson's agenda tonight. They have a long agenda that includes wastewater and other topics. So my expectations were set for 8 to 8.30. I actually have quite a lot of time. But we could be easily half an hour with you here. So I'd rather do it sooner than later. Yeah, that half hour's fine. If it takes an hour, I don't know how, what your habits are for 
getting into the issues, right. but you definitely got an hour of my time. Okay, so you're, you're talking, Mike, in terms of going into executive session? That is correct. And we need to do that because the data is confidential? That is correct. Okay, Did so you want me to quick... jump off? No, you can stay, Jess. Okay. I, I think um, we probably need a motion to uh, amend the agenda. So move. Uh, <laughs> you're the man, Nat. A little bit more. Matt's hungry. I make a motion to update the agenda to start the executive session now at the end of the VLCT discussion. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any objection? Hearing none, the agenda is amended. Um, you, you're good at the next one, Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I move that we go into executive session in order to discuss um, a contractual matter, the premature disclosure of which could prejudice the interests of Hardwick Electric Department. Is second. there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, it is 6.34 p.m. and we are going into executive session, so. Mike. Okay. Yep. We're, I am recording. Okay, it is 7.47 and we are out of executive session. So, um, we have uh, discussed options for authorizing Mike to enter into an agreement with VEPSA to get between, depend, it, it, the amount changes by year from 8760 megawatt hours on up to 13,000 megawatt hours per year from uh, hydro producers at a not to exceed price that is less than what we are currently paying for that block of power. I think that it's a sensible proposal. Is there any other discussion about it? You didn't mention uh, that you had the presentation from BEPSA, et cetera. Yes, we had a detailed presentation. I think we've been, we've been at uh, for over an hour, but that'll be reflected in how long the, I didn't notice when we went into executive session. Um, so so we've, we've spent considerable amount of time and, and the overall effect of this is, is a, a relatively small proportion of our, of our kilowatt hours. Um, and, and so, um, is there any further discussion? We're going to authorize Mike to sign a commitment letter. Uh, you're, you're okay. You, well, that's, that's the question. Do you want to make a motion? Well, I mean, is that, is that appropriate yet? Yes. Okay. Yes. That he, that he, that Mike be charged with signing the commitment letter to VEPSA in view of our discussion this evening. The commitment letter that was distributed to us earlier today. Right. I uh, second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing no opposition, it passes unanimously. Thank so, you, Sean. Sean, Thanks, thank Sean. you so much. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Have a good evening, everybody. You too. Now Sean is heading to Lindenville. Ooh. -hoo. Johnson. No, now he's Johnson. doing Johnson tonight. Yeah. Johnson tonight. Yeah. Okay. Um, which takes us back to our agenda. Uh, were there any questions on the COVID report? 
Great work. I know you asked for questions, not comments, but I thought that was really good work with the outreach and all that. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well done indeed. Well, yeah, good we on. also have done, we did another round this week of phone calls. And we've got uh, probably 20 door notes that we're going to put out for specific ones that didn't have phone numbers on their account. Oh, that's really good. So go directly to the door with the, that's great. Right, that, with the pamphlet. Do, the, the, I noticed that there were several, not that many, but there were several applications that were um, denied. Do we know why they were? And is that something that can be rectified? In other words, um, can, or, or was it just a case that people's income was too high or something like that? Two things, I'll jump in here. Uh, the kudos for those efforts really no, need to go to Jess and the office staff. They did a great job. And Jessica uh, approves or uh, denies those applications. So she can speak to that for you right here. Um, yeah, so we have, I think we've had six applications that I've had to deny. Um, uh, two of them were because they applied as non-residential and they were residential accounts, uh, which my understanding is that they were informed that they could reapply as a residential customer, but neither of them have. Um, um, the right. other... One of them wasn't even a hydro collector customer, so I don't even know why it came to us in <laughs> Florida. <laughs> and then the last ones, um, the biggest thing is that customers are still trying to pay. And so the payments are applying to their 60 days and 90 days past due. And they didn't have any 60 days and 90 days that qualified. So... That's unfortunate when you think yeah. about it. It really is, because we've had a lot of people that could have gotten a lot of money, but they just barely paid $500, so. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments for on this? Uh, then moving on to the Manager's report, any questions or comments? Yes, if you want to run, you can. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Thank have you, a Jess. good night, guys. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Long night. One. Thank you. Where, where was that tree that uh, created a three hour uh, outage last week? Mike was in. <laughs> Yeah, right it was on, from my house. It was on Hardwick, Hardwick Street, right near uh, Mike's house, I think. I think oh, yeah, I saw, I saw that tree. Wow. This morning. I missed that. There, there, was, there was one thing, and I guess should have asked something while Jess was still here. Mike, in, in you, I, I just wondered if there was a typo in um, the revenue sales numbers. Um, this is on page 10 of the... Okay, hang on a second. Jess! <laughs> you! Come here for, come here for a second. <laughs> I caught That's her. That's the hang Hardwick on. Electric paging system. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> High tech. <laughs> uh, what? I, I'm sorry, Jess, it's what? my what? fault. What? Oh, excuse me. Hello. Hi. Oh, on, on the um, revenue sales, on the second page that has revenue sales budget to actual by customer class and by um, month. Page are we talking page it's page 10 of the PDF. Gotcha. Okay. She's digging. Oh, do you have the PDF open? No. no. Okay. So you're looking at the revenues. There's this current month and year to date page and packet. Is that what's one? Uh, it, it's it's. Um, I'm going. I'm it's looking before, at. It's just before the utility award amount status thing. It's the page before that. Oh, we're looking at COVID stuff. Okay. 
Sorry, my brain was not there. I thought we were moving on financials. Oh. I did too. No, I I I, apo I apologize. I I knew I had <laughs> put notes in in mine and I had and I missed it. Okay, so you were looking at the revenues to actual 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 budget. At budget to actual yeah. by month by customer class. So it's the second page of it. Yep. And and most months, sometimes the budget is a little bit higher. Sometimes the actual is a little bit higher, but. For residential, we have the actual being 50% higher than budget for October. Is that right? Yeah, it's our, it, has to, it has all to do with the seasonal. So, our, uh, okay, that's what it was. All right. So the seasonal income came in in that month. It's what it is, is that's a but, you know, because we have to buy the power for the seasonal customers all year long because they use all year long, but we only build them out twice, twice a year. Twice. So the budgeting is always off. But why do we, why don't we reflect that in the budget then? Because the VEPS is the one who does the budget. I yeah, but we sure no, but we they... give them we give them the sales data. We've been over this before. You know, if if we have things that vary seasonally, and and there are things where budgets vary by month, what's the point of looking at month at monthly comparisons if we don't? So then we should we should adjust the budget to reflect what we expect. Tell us how you want to see it. I just think budgets, you know, ought to be based on the mm. best. Yeah, best so then, our, then our purchase budget will be, our purchasing budget would be correct and our revenues will still be skewed because it's only the twice a year. And I, I, my point is, I don't think there's a perfect way to do it. So we don't, we don't care how you want it. We'll do whatever you want. Okay. Well, I, I mean, mostly I was just wondering why there was that disparity because it, it was just in October and it was very noticeable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, do, we don't have to get into this. No, nope. that's one, that's one miserable, point. one miserable way to solve it would be to send a bill every month to the seasonal people. Yeah. That would be really miserable. No, no. There's other ways, but anyhow, that's that's fine. We don't have to belabor it. Thank you, Jess. It was a, it was a clear answer as to why the number yeah. was different. Right. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay, she's running down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> as quickly as she can. With earmuffs on. <laughs> so, Mike, on your yes. your fuel switching project. Having to do yeah. with him, how in the why is it we we end up with thirty five thousand dollars from that for Rex? One hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. So what it is is our tier three requirement, which is the hardest one for utilities to hit or help with, really, is primarily by getting our customers to change fuels. And the hemp facility was in business for several years running on a big dirty diesel generator. And they were gonna get another big dirty diesel generator to put right next to it, but they tied to us instead. And the elimination of those generators and all the fuel they use and the emissions they put off cranked a big bucket of money for us. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Where's, that, where's yeah. that money coming from? Your federal uh, the, tax the dollars. Yeah, yeah. The state <laughs> calculates the RECs with the EEU and they go into our three year bucket and we have to use them within those three years or we lose them. We have to retire them within those three years. There are and other utilities up, that, that need uh, them. Right. We had seven years worth of tier three RECs in that one bucket. So I sold that pile of them. Uh, plus a lot more, and we still have over two years left. Okay, it was the changing, the switching. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other one that's that's going to happen here, I'm not sure exactly when, but it'll probably be early next year, is uh, Authentic Log Homes. They run on a big, dirty generator, and they want to tie to us. So it's going to be another one of those same things. Huh. 
Good. Great. Good projects for many reasons. That's just yeah. one of them, right? Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Any other discussion with respect to the general manager's report? Always good reading. Any other or new business? Well, I wonder, given that we're almost three hours in, do we want to have two meetings a month? I think I think that this was unusual in that we had two presentations, right? Yeah. Um, of of that that took some time. Okay. So we may, if we need to. Yeah, I think if I'm I'm, I'm with you now. If we see agendas coming together that are going to be three hour marathons, let's break them in half. Yeah. No, I I I agree with that. Um, I just, I'm, I'm hoping this was exceptional. I, I, Me too. Okay, here, here's another little uh, uh, aside question with regard to the same kind of issue. Um, we start at five o'clock or even later because in the past we've had somebody, a working stiff like Gina who had, couldn't get here from Montpelier until five or later. We actually could meet most any time, most of us, I think. Um, and I should think that the people coming to the meeting, a real meeting, in person would want to come earlier. Uh, in the case of Mike, uh, Mike and Jessica are sitting there in the office till close to eight o'clock. I mean, I should think we, ought, we, we might consider starting at 3.30 or four o'clock in the afternoon, not at five, so we go right through the dinner hour. Yeah, I, I, like, I like what you're suggesting, but I'll, I'll, I'd run into conflicts a lot. Well, I, I'm sure there's no perfect time, but so- I, you, God. I mean, I, I would like to meet earlier, but I think also, I mean, to, we don't get any public or seldom do, but, you know, if people work, they wouldn't be able to, in, in conventional, you know, in nine to five jobs, they're not going to be able to come to an, to an earlier meeting. But now, now what, what do you, what do you new guys think at time wise? I'm open to any time. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. But on your point, uh, Lynn, we're now YouTube or something. We're on public television, having been recorded, so that probably is available lots I'm, of times. I don't know how I'm that. I'm talking works. about people who want to come and say something at the meeting. Who no, the real? And, and 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 that's gonna meeting during business hours is going to mean that there on. there may be people who who can't do that. Because we may never go back to that, of course. Well, don't take my comment as a definite no. I mean, I, I'll accommodate what the majority want to do. Well, I like right. Matt's idea that if, if our agendas are going to be this this long, then we should be having two meetings instead yeah. of one. Yeah. It's hard no to more. know until we don't we don't know, though. I mean, us commissioners don't know until the Friday before the meeting. So in, you in, in hindsight on this one, we should have known. When, when, when we got the stuff and there was gonna be the presentation from Sean and we had the insurance stuff, um, I, I think this, was, this sure one was it. probably foreseeable. Well, it's probably okay once you've announced a meeting to reduce the agenda, um, but you, you, you can't add to the agenda. So if you're gonna have another meeting, we have to give it you know, a couple of weeks warning. Okay, well, it's just something to think about. For now, we'll stick with five o'clock. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to extend it any more than it needs to be, but I did have one question about um, the uh, uh, VLCT passive payments. Um, I, I just noticed that the the premium was thirty eight thousand or so for uh, you know annual premium, and I noticed that fourth quarter twenty twenty was just about half of that. So I don't know if we're paying like two quarters, I mean, you know, twice a year or- What, what, are, you, what are you, what are you, what are you- um, I can't what see what page this is. Uh, let's see, it's, it's what accounts- it, it is split up then. We don't okay. pay it all at once, yeah. But, but it would end up coming if it was quarterly, it would end up being 58,000 rather than 38. If, if uh, it- 
Yeah, no, the total's under 40. I know that, but I okay. can't rattle that off the top of my head exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah, I just uh, yeah, I saw the fourth quarter and then it was that amount, so I just multiplied it by four. It might be we do pay it once a year in the fourth quarter. Right, right. Yeah. Which would make sense based on what Fred advised us earlier that they don't finish their stuff for the next year till the end of uh, June or the beginning of July. Anything else on before we go to the next item on the agenda? It's going to be quick. Hearing none. Um, is that I'll, I'll make a motion. Um, I move that we <laughs> go into uh, executive session to discuss a confidential customer matter. Is Second. there any objection? Hearing none, uh, we are going into executive session at 8.06 p.m. Resuming. It is 8.13 and we are out of executive session. There was no act, there is no need to take any action. Um, so, so Mike, you said that now is, uh, that you're gonna be gone from Saturday to Saturday on vacation? Correct. And And everybody knows what they need to do in your absence. Yep, everything's lined up and all the ducks are in a row and everybody knows how to get a hold of me if they need me, so we're all good. Who's the boss when you're gone, Brian? Brian runs the cruise anyway. I mean, I support right. them. Um, <coughs> re really the biggest hurdle is trying to get uh, checks processed so that we can get things paid and paychecks out because I have to sign those. So other than that, as long as we stay on top of things, you know, there's a good team here and well, I got two other municipals that support us while I'm gone. So we're fine. Have fun. Have Thank a you. wonderful time. I plan on it. Stay Remember safe. The <laughs> Remember the sunscreen. Yeah. No, you ain't kidding. Okay. Okay. Uh, Did I hear a motion? I haven't heard one yet. Is <laughs> Out of the way, Roger. Second and third. <laughs> I gotta go have dinner. Uh, hearing no objection, we <laughs> are adjourned at 8.15 p.m. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay well. <laughs>